Uh, today we're joined by Barry Padgett, COO at Imperity. Firstly, Barry, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Marty. Cool. And so Barry joins us from Seattle uh, in the US. Um, and Barry, I'd love for you to actually just give, give the audience a bit of introduction of yourself. And I'd really love you to expand your global footprint because you're probably one of the, the most prolific global citizens that I've come across uh, in my career. Um, and had the privilege of working with. So I'd love for you to share that footprint with the audience. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in general, like my career has spanned uh, companies that really kind of focus on solving a bunch of frustrating and yet seemingly simple um, uh, end user or consumer problems. So kind of three main buckets. One was a company called Concur. Uh, I started, there was 15 of us. I was an engineer. Uh, I was living in Amsterdam uh, at the time. And I stayed with that company for 20 years and uh, eventually I left. There were 10,000 of us and I was president and CEO. Uh, so lived all over the world, across Europe, across Asia for uh, about 15 of those 20 years. Um, setting up and running teams, um, collaborating uh, across continents uh, and then running multiple regions. Um, and you know, the, the, the fun part about the Concur journey was really solving seemingly um, a, uh, you know, a fairly simple problem that just no one had done well yet. And that was business travel. How do you make business travel pleasurable? How do you make it predictable? How do you make it enjoyable? Um, given that a lot of us spend a lot of time uh, traveling for work. And so that was a fantastic uh, experience. I then moved uh, and ran a company called Ariba, procurement company, um, basically solving the buying and selling of stuff between companies. Um, I was the CEO and president there for a couple of years uh, under the SAP umbrella. Moved to a company called Stripe, um, which again is trying to solve this idea of international transfer of value. How do I buy something from one place and deliver it to another? Um, seemingly pretty easy when you're in, in one spot from Australia to Australia or US yeah. to US. Um, and then most recently at a company called uh, Amparity, which really is trying to figure out how do you take the, the world's gnarliest, rawest, dirtiest data and put it together for companies in a way that they can really start to uh, harmonize the the desire between experience and personalization and mm -hmm. kind of protect the the sanctimonious relationship between brands and their and their best customers and so i've enjoyed doing that uh, all over the world and for the last uh, eight or nine years here up and down the west coast of the united states well i'm going to actually come back to and really appreciate the introduction because it is a uh, a distinguished professional career and what you're doing with the team at imperity is it's incredible. I follow it and it's actually amazing what you guys are doing in that space. The, I want to, I want to start with leadership for a minute, because if I go through the, let's call it an honor roll of the leaders that you've worked with at Concur, Stephen Raj Singh, uh, you look at SAP, you work directly with Bill McDermott uh, and their executive team. You're now working at Imperity with Kabir Shahani, who I've actually met and absolutely huge admiration for as a leader and an individual. And then you also worked with Patrick and John Collison as well. That's right. They're pretty prolific leaders you've worked with. If you could put it, distill it down to one or two things that you saw in the traits of that leadership um, that really did work into, and you worked for great organizations, what, what would they be? Yeah, I think the, the, that's a great question, Marty. I think the thing that's really common across uh, the folks that I've worked um, closely with over the last 20 years and probably fairly commonly across a lot of the great leaders that we look at. Um, two things for me stand out. One, tremendous passion and energy for solving the problem, right? There's, there's an, in fact, the people that you just mentioned, there's no better salespeople for the companies that they represent than those folks. Yeah. Um, they really care about the problem they're solving deep down. They've got great stories and tremendous personal pain that mm. fuels their desire to solve that problem, much like you know, your story with Stratapp and how the company got started and dreaming it up while you're sitting on a plane wondering why you were making yet another, another journey for yet another internal meeting. Um, so I think that's number one. And then number two, a real customer centricity about them, um, a real sort of out to in focus on their company, yeah. um, dreaming about it and looking at it constantly through the lens of the customer. Um, I think those two things in particular um, I'm drawn to when I, uh, when I work with people, when I hire people. And certainly the leaders that you mentioned, I think they embody that. Yeah, I love that. Because um, you actually touched on the other piece that we will talk about, which is people. You know, who, who we go to work with and how we energize all of that to all work towards the same thing. And so, you know, 
I'm taught, you know, one of the things that we're really passionate about at StratApp is helping organizations deliver on a clear plan. And ensuring that clear plan is absolutely seamlessly laid across the entire organization so everybody's clear what's expected of them. And I'll talk about the ownership piece of that as well, but just on the plan side. So sh share with me, because you, you, you've managed across, man, every geography in the world, right? There's not a, there's not a country in the world that has a, it has a footprint that you haven't touched. In, in your uh, in your career, so let's talk about the importance of creating that clear plan so the teams across the organisation can own. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things there. I think one, kind of like you know, some of the best scenes. If you talk to directors, they always you know joke that the best scenes are are left on the cutting room floor, mm. uh, and some of their best work is left on the cutting room floor. I kind of think the same way about strategy in some ways, business strategy. I think a lot of the best strategy has been left on a whiteboard, accidentally erased, maybe overnight by the cleaning crew, um, because it is really challenging. It's, it's not that hard, I think, to be honest, to, to ideate and to create and to come up with strategy. I think we all kind of enjoy that part of, of business. Yeah. Um, the challenging thing is translating that into the operational mechanics of either orchestrating a team of five people or a team of 50,000 people to actually bring it to life mm -hmm. uh, and to bring that, that, that vision to reality uh, for the customer. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that's, that's not really been solved particularly well yet. Um, and you mentioned, like, how do you do that or what my personal experience in kind of delivering that strategy has been. And I think, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not all that uncommon for, the majority of that strategy work to be delivered in person uh, via airplanes. Mm -hmm. and, and I know, uh, you know, yes. you've lived this life as well. You know, when you look back at your career and, and you figure out that 80% of your working life was spent mm -hmm. traveling, uh, whether in a plane, on your way to an airport, in a taxi cab, at a hotel, you know, away from your friends and your family and your hobbies yes. and, and your kids and your spouse or your partner, um, you know, you don't recognize it at the time because you're, you know, you have passion uh, for the job and passion for the people. But I think in many ways, we've relied on that as the construct of delivering strategy to individuals and in, in that being the, the sort of connective tissue between what goes on in that whiteboard and yeah. what goes on on the keyboards um, of the team that are delivering it. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely have embodied exactly what you've said and lived it. So, no, and by the way, there's thousands of people that we listen to this absolutely have resonated with what you're saying. Um, and building that clarity of that plan and then the transparency of it is incredibly important, especially today in COVID times. Yeah. Where we're not face to face and we don't have the luxury of motivating people when we're in the room together. We need to actually find other paths and avenues to motivate them as well. I'm going to, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, on that point, I was asked this the other day um, by a journalist. We were talking about kind of customer data platforms and this, this um, uh, all the appetite in the market right now from kind of the world's largest consumer brands um, who are investing in that space. And the question was around COVID and the, and the global pandemic and whether that's been a change agent for a lot of consumer brands and how they think about personalization or delivering value to their customers or delivering services. And, you know, I think that, you know, I think that kind of similar to what we're talking about, Marty, with strategy, I think brands trying to deliver personalized experiences and recognizing their best customers um, has always been a goal. And so I, I see the pandemic less as a change agent and more as an accelerator mm -hmm. for things that they've always wanted to do. They just, yeah. they just have to do it now. And I feel like the same is true with regards to kind of strategy and collaboration and how you think about global execution when we can't rely on, on butts in, in airplane seats anymore as being that connective tissue and it's acting as an accelerator for us to get really serious about how we empower our teams um, to effectively understand, digest, collaborate, um, and ultimately deliver the company vision. Yeah, absolutely agree. Let's talk about empowering teams for a second. So, and, 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 you, and you are hands down one of the best I've seen uh, do that. Think of the pandemic environment and you're now doing this with Imperity, but you've also done it at, at scale with other organizations, minus the pandemic, but you've still had the disconnect with the teams every single day. Now that we're not going to be in the same rooms together, where do you see the greatest challenges for organizations 
whether it's um, the infrastructure that we put in place, whether it's the technology we put in place, what do you see as the biggest challenges we're facing right now to ensure that our teams are moving towards the common direction and we've got everybody engaged on the journey? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think it's one that, that we're all thinking about, you know, yeah. 10 to 12 hours a day now, uh, every day. I, I guess the way I approach the, the sort of the response there would be kind of thinking back across a couple of different uh, you know, books uh, and lessons that I learned over the years. And I think one of them that, that springs to mind, there's a book by uh, a gentleman named Patrick Lencioni, who kind of who wrote things like Five Dysfunctions of a Team and uh, things of that nature. He wrote a book called The Three Signs of a Miserable Job. I won't, I won't spoil it for your listeners or viewers yeah. um, with uh, disclosing all three, but one of them, one of the three was relevance. Mm -hmm. um, and that no matter what job you have, delivering the mail, running a big company, making ball bearings, printing t-shirts, sweeping floors, whatever it is that you do, um, the happiest employees, the most engaged employees, the most fulfilled employees um, are those that have, feel like they have some sort of relevance, that they can relate the work they do to the outcome. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, when I, when I reflect on the question you asked, I think, again, as a, less as a change agent and more as an accelerator, is how do we ensure that our teams feel relevant and are relevant to what we're trying to achieve as, as a company and what we're trying yeah. to deliver to our customers. And I think that relevance is manifest or is rooted in, in the idea that you know, they want to they wanna know um, how they can participate. They want to know how they can add value. Mm. They want to be able to measure that value. And so when you think about delivering strategy or you think about delivering goals or objectives, um, I think that relevance is maybe the thing that springs to mind me, you know, springs to mind first and foremost as, as maybe the most important component of, of delivering that strategy. Um, yeah. How do you ensure that it's relevant to the people that you're delivering it to and the work that they do has relevance in the way that it's ultimately delivered to the customer? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, I've been on a lot of groups lately and it was interesting the front of the pandemic because obviously a hundred percent remote, everyone threw in the likes of Microsoft Teams and Zoom and we all sort of went rah, rah and, and, and people were sort of sharing their personal feelings to what happens when they got off the, the call. Yeah. And, and it yeah. was empty. They were empty. They found themselves looking at the fridge. They found themselves looking at the TV. Uh, and, and it was really interesting. When you're in a work environment, this was one of the ones that really stood out for me. When you're in a work environment, you're at the office, you have purpose, you have relevance. Whether it's the right purpose or relevance could be questionable because it's activity. But the minute you're by yourself and you have to define what that is, it becomes very empty for a lot of people. So I think we have to close that gap, absolutely close that gap for everybody so they know exactly what the purpose is. And that's where I get really passionate about enablement. Now, how do we enable a set of simple tools for our teams and the individuals, not just look at the top of the pyramid as a decision maker and say, this is what I need. How do we go that layer deeper? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's right on. Um, and I think the, to your point on kind of on Zoom and Teams and, and uh, Skype and um, Chime and Blue Jeans and all the things we're now all experts in that we never really wanted to be experts in. Yeah. I think we confused early on the notion that communication was the same thing as collaboration. Mm. You know, and if you look at email or you look at Slack or you look at Zoom uh, or Teams, they're fantastic communication tools. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't really necessarily bleed over into true collaboration tools. And I yeah. think that's where we're, we're struggling to your point. Like we were all like, oh, this is amazing. Like no latency. We can talk, you know, you're in Australia, I'm in the United States and it's like we're in the same room together. That's amazing. That's fantastic communication. Yeah. Um, but is it really fueling collaboration and really getting us closer to the end goal or objective or strategy that we've agreed is super important? Yeah. Um, I think we're realizing now that we have great communication, but we're still a little, we're still a little shy of, of great collaboration. We're still a little, we're still a little short on that front. And so I think, again, not necessarily a change agent, great accelerator for us to, to look at things like Strata. Yeah. Yeah. No, very cool. And so um, I, I want to sort of, and actually you just touched into it. I, I want to talk about some of the challenges that you're seeing and heard of. Uh, I talked about some of them about the emptiness when we get off this touch point um, and us finding the purpose. And you talk great about purpose and, and relevance. I love it. 
what are some of the other challenges that you're seeing across the workforce and across you know the counterparts and the companies that you've seen through this really difficult period that you're you're trying to solve for your organization to make sure that the team is all focused on the right outcome yeah i think you know when we pull employees um and i think everybody's doing this right trying to figure out you know what the new normal is how do we keep people engaged how do we keep them happy how do we keep them productive how do we drive relevance and purpose and so we're surveying we're, we're, we're giving people survey fatigue probably right all over the world it's maybe a, it's a good time to be in the survey business perhaps um, but consistently the things that come back for us um, are not necessarily that people miss like the physical space like miss being physically in the office a lot of people don't miss the commute you know yeah. a lot of people have kids now that are at home uh, doing virtual online school and so it's 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 not you know very convenient for them to leave uh, for the entire day um, but what we do hear consistently is people miss the collaboration they miss the whiteboard time they miss the ideation um, they miss that back and forth and kind of you know arriving at answers together uh, arriving at outcomes together um, and I think that's the thing it's again really hard to do over a zoom call when you've got 15 yeah. people in a panel yeah. um, and it's great that you're all chatting and communicating but there's not a lot of collaboration going on um, yeah. and so there, again is there's a miss and I think a lot of companies if you look over you know the last 20 years have tried in various ways to solve this right whether it's like huddle or base camp or even like uh sharepoint like back in the day like all those sorts of things had had the the, the right uh question just never had the technology and the timing wasn't right to deliver on the answer um yeah. and so i think for us consistently the thing that we see is is as most difficult is less communication people i think feel fatigued with both the surveying and the communication like you're on back-to-back -back zoom calls for 10 yeah. hours a day yeah. and you're tired and you're exhausted and you worked your tail off yeah. But then you kind of look back on the day and you're like, I didn't really get any stuff done. You know, my to-do list is bigger yeah. at the end of the day than when it started. And I work for 10 hours and I'm exhausted. Um, and so there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Actually, I'm really excited because you actually touch on something. We're working with a Seattle-based consulting company uh, on this exact topic about how do they engage their clients before the sessions, during the sessions and post the sessions. So they're actually running our work boards and live meeting notes. Mm. Uh, to do that because it actually allows them to have structure notes and then collaboration all in that one seamless place and you can start collaborating before you even get to the sessions yeah, yeah and so it's, it's really interesting what you touched on then because it is a it's just an incredible area you talked about earlier leadership passion it's just an area that i'm incredibly passionate about of delivering a seamless and simple connected workspace and, and if yeah. you can do that in a very simple manner i think everyone gets value so I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask you, and I, and I apologize up front to all the viewers for the self plug because you have been across Strat App for a little while. Um, and so, if you were if you were a uh, executive or a team lead out there in the global marketplace, how how would you sort of best describe the, the value out of Strat App that they could get from the tool itself? Yeah, you know, I think we've been we've been talking about it for the last few minutes. Um, I think there's a real disconnect right now between, again, the, the ideation and creative vision of strategy. I, I think a lot of executive management teams would score themselves pretty highly uh, yeah. on knowing what it is they need to do, um, yeah. whether that's accelerating a particular direction, whether that's acting defensively in another part of their business, um, whether it's being aggressive. Um, it doesn't, you know, I don't think that there's a, a, a shortage of great ideas and confidence um at the top end of most companies and whether you're talking about a 10 person company or a hundred thousand person company i think that's yeah. true um i think the challenge right now um that everybody would agree to universally and it's partly pandemic driven is like how do we actually turn that strategy into active daily work like how do we ensure that that strategy is actually manifest in the work that all of our people do um that we can actually measure the results we can see uh, that activity. We can performance manage it like we performance manage everything else in our business. Okay. Um, yeah. And how do we ensure that the team that are, that are doing the work, again, feel that relevance, feel that purpose, feel connected um, with the work that they're doing and how uh, it's going to deliver value for the company, how it's going to deliver value for them uh, yeah. in their own career arc, and then also deliver, of course, value for the customer. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say that's the gap. And you, you know, you, you're marinated in this and you, you talk about this every day. Um, but I'm sure that you're probably getting a lot of a lot of nodding in a lot of boardrooms saying, "Yeah, Marty, that's that's the problem we have." Yeah, 
Yeah, and it, you're 100 percent right. It's it's the problem, the disconnect between strategy and the day-to-day -day execution is needs to be solved, and, and we're on the journey of solving that with our clients. It's the ability to take that planning session and then really work into the enablement piece. Right? Yeah. That, that, that to me is the disconnect that we need to go as a journey, uh, as, as organizations. And if we don't get there as in one, one seamless tech, uh, like straight up, I guess we're gonna try and then go out to disparate tech. And yeah. we're gonna have five, six, seven, eight different things flowing across the organization, which is really where we're at today. And then all of that source data is not coming back to what matters, which is the plan. Yeah. That's and every company on the planet. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, I think every company on the planet, again, no matter the business they're in, even if it's a restaurant, like it doesn't have to be high tech, um, are data driven, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're growing up now and our kids are growing up in very performance oriented cultures. Yeah. Um, everything is measured, you yeah. know, um, your heart rate's measured when you sleep now. You can't, yeah. you can't even, you can't even get a, you know, respite when you're asleep in your bed, something's getting measured, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I do think that, you know, most of the things in our business have great tooling. There's great process. Um, the mechanics are in place and have been for a long time. But when you think about maybe the, the, the greatest asset that any company has, which are its people and the work that they perform, it's not getting measured, you know? Yeah, and it's less right. about being big brothery or creepy and keeping tabs on people. And it's more about connecting connecting the work both to one another and connecting the work to the, the objectives the company has. Yeah, I love it. Because I really, if you can empower a leader to be so value driven to their team and not retrospective data driven, right? Imagine the connectedness between the leader and the team or vice versa, Yeah, the team and the leader. And that's the way that we think about it. We're reversed engineers, the modeling of looking at what are the teams need to align, prioritize, collaborate, and execute in a seamless manner. And yes, the information is available, but it's there for everyone to add value to it so we can move it forward. Yeah, and think yeah. about the number of um, links in the chain that you remove when those two ends of the spectrum are connected, right? Mm -hmm. You're no longer you know, uh, reporting uh, results up um, because they're known. Um, yeah. You're, yeah. you're marinated in the results as they're happening. Um, and then you're also not packaging a bunch of results and pushing them down, right? And it's a big reveal and a big surprise in the big monthly meeting. Here's yeah. how we're doing. Um, it'd be great if you could eliminate those links and you have real-time collaboration resulting in real-time awareness and real-time relevance such that, you know, you're, you're not working in these antiquated sort of communication channels anymore. Yeah. Imagine if we could take out five one-on-ones this week because if we already had the information, we've collaborated and we've moved it forward. Yeah. I love the way you talk about just communication and collaboration because they are two totally different things. Collaboration is contextually relevant. Collaboration has clear purpose and then collaboration is designed for the organization. Correct. Right? It's not an isolated function that we should yeah. be going out to to run. Yeah, I love it. And so, so Barry, I, I, could, I could talk to you all day. Um, I could ask another million questions, but I really appreciate you taking uh, time on the spotlight session with me. And, uh, you know, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Best of luck. Thanks, mate.